Hein, and welcome uh, to the Physiology of Electronic Fetal Monitoring. This training session will be presented by Emily Hamilton. Dr. Hamilton, as well as leading Perigen's clinical research team, is an experienced obstetrician. She's the inventor of the Pericom clinical support system and an adjunct, prof adjunct professor of obstetrics and gynecology at McGill. She's well published and presents uh, her research internationally. Our objective today is to discuss the physiology of heart rate regulation. Uh, we will also examine some landmark animal studies which have laid the foundation for our understanding of how the fetal responds to stresses in labor. Uh, we will point out relevance to clinical usage as we go. So let's begin. The heart is a muscle with its own pacemakers, conducting system, and numerous types of receptors. It has direct neuronal connections to both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems. And it's exposed to circulating catecholamines. Thus, ultimately, any influence on heart rate must be mediated by one or more of these intrinsic or extrinsic factors. Now, modulation of the heart rate is mostly driven by the cardioregulatory center, which resides in the medulla oblongata. And it contains an acceleratory side and an inhibitory side. The acceleratory side increases heart rate directly via the sympathetic cardiac nerves, which interact with the heart and its conducting system. Norepinephrine is released by the sympathetic division. This accelerates heart rate and strengthens contractions. The cardio-inhibitory center slows the heart rate via the vagus nerves, which interact also with the heart and its conducting system and muscle. And reducing cardio-inhibitory activity increases heart rate. Now, how does the cardioregulatory center know what signals to send to the heart? Well, it receives input from three sources, the central nervous system and visceral centers called chemoreceptors or baroreceptors that are constantly monitoring the state of the peripheral cardiovascular system. Now, you may have experienced an example of central nervous system influence on the acceleratory response. When you're driving on a lonely highway and suddenly you hear sirens and see a police car flashing in your rearview mirror. In response to this sudden auditory and stimu visual stimulation, the central nervous system activates the cardioacceleratory center. Your heart rate rises, may sweat a little, become hyper alert. These are all sympathetic effects. And this is the same pathway which is activated when we use vibroacoustic stimulation in labor. Baroreceptors are located in the aortic arch and carotid arteries. They are sensitive to stretch, an increase in blood pressure, stretches these receptors in the vascular wall and causes them to send neuronal messages to the cardio-inhibitory center, which in turn causes a slowing of the fetal heart rate via the parasympathetic nerve. And we will see later that fetal hypertension is an important part of the mechanisms producing fetal heart rate deceleration. Chemoreceptors are sensitive to low pH and oxygen saturation. They're located in the aortic and carotid arteries. When they are activated, they cause the cardioacceleratory center to increase sympathetic impulses, resulting in an increase in heart rate. Now, the sympathetic system has other effects, depending upon the structure that it innervates. And it innervates essentially every organ and vasculature of the body. The parasympathetic system has a similar but not identical and very wide distribution. The sympathetic system can stimulate the adrenal glands directly causing them to release catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, into the bloodstream. Catecholamine released from the adrenals can be precipitated by sudden stresses, like that police car in your rearview mirror, or by slowly developing conditions like low blood sugar or low pH. And the duration of catecholamine-mediated effects from the adrenal are relatively slow due to the time it takes to be secreted from the adrenal glands, to be transported to the heart for the concentration to rise and fall, and their half-life is about two to three minutes. Now, the purpose of the cardiovascular system is to maintain adequate blood flow to all organs. The heart cannot accomplish this in isolation. In addition to heart rate modulation, cardioregulatory center 
There is also a vasomotor center, and it receives input in a similar fashion from the central nervous system and from these peripheral chemoreceptors and baroreceptors. And the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems and circulating catechol warnings can affect the diameter of peripheral blood vessels, thus changing blood pressure and redistributing blood flow so that in critical situations, circulation to vital tissues is maintained. So let's examine how this physiology applies to the fetus in labor. Now there are thousands of excellent papers on fetal cardiac physiology and fetal heart rate monitoring. I've not read them all, I've read a lot, and I have three that I would highly recommend to you. One, Dr. Martin's classic work elucidating the mechanism of late deceleration in sheep. Two, Dr. Westgate's superb review of animal and human studies regarding decelerations in labor. She's conducted many of these studies herself and is a clinician as well. And finally, the excellent fetal monitoring uh, textbook authored by Drs. Friedman, Najiot, Gary, and Ms. Miller. So let's look for a moment now at uh, animal experimentation side. The first challenge was to simulate the stresses that fetal experiences in labor. Well, cord compression was relatively easy to simulate. Uh, they implanted clamps or collars which surrounded the umbilical cord and that they could squeeze intermittently. Utero placental insufficiency was a little bit harder to simulate, but they did this by compressing uterus arteries outside the uterus, thus decreasing blood flow and oxygen flow to the placenta as they compressed these arteries. In addition, they implanted, implanted a number of devices that would measure things such as blood pressure or acid-base status at any time. Thus, they could manipulate these conditions and measure exactly what was happening in terms of uh, blood pressure or biochemistry. And then they could determine what physiological mechanisms were at play by blocking and unblocking various parts of the sympathetic and parasympathetic system with drugs or by actually cutting the vagus nerves. Well, let's look at some of that work uh, by Dr. Martin. And I've taken the liberty of redrawing some of his results and putting them on fetal graph paper because that's the uh, monitoring scales that we're most familiar with as clinicians. So he simulated utero placental insufficiency by compressing the uterine arteries, decreasing blood flow to the fetus. And he did this with repetitive one-minute occlusions and measured a variety of things. And what he found was with the occlusion, Fetal blood pressure increased, you can see on the top. Fetal heart responded with a deceleration, which was essentially a mirror image of the hypertension. The deceleration was gradual in onset, gradual in ending, and late in timing, just like the pattern of hypertension. And note in this experiment that both the pH and the base excess are normal. When he gave phentolamine, a drug that blocks the alpha adrenergic part of the sympathetic system, that part that causes vasoconstriction, the hypertension was abolished, and so was the deceleration. When he added atropine, blocked the vagus nerve, the fetal heart actually increased during the occlusion period. And finally, when he blocked the beta component of the sympathetic system, the response was that the acceleration was abolished. In other words, the late deceleration produced in this experiment, decreasing uterine artery blood flow, normal pHs had nothing to do with myocardium. It was entirely mediated by the autonomic nervous system. And these experiments gave rise to this cascade uh, of, of mechanisms involved uh, in late decelerations with normal uh, acid-base status. Decreased oxygen stimulates the chemoreceptor pathway, resulting in sympathetic discharge, vasoconstriction, and hypertension which in turn stimulates the baroreceptor re reflex and the vagus system slows the heart. Now the following graphs show what happened when the occlusions continued to the point of creating acidosis. A very different picture emerges. The two panels on the right uh, show the responses when the pH has fallen to very low levels. And there are three changes. First, there is no hypertension. Two, the baseline level is much higher. And three, the decelerations were deeper and steeper. In fact, in the last panel, the fetal sheep actually experienced a fall in blood pressure during the occlusion. Now, he went on to do other experiments, 
In this experiment, he confirmed that these major decelerations in the presence of severe acidemia had nothing to do with the parasympathetic system. The deceleration on the left is what you saw before, and on the right, in the same sheep, this one was given complete vagal blockade with atropine, and we can see that the decelerations persisted. In fact, he went on to give complete sympathetic and complete parasympathetic blockade, and the decelerations persisted. So utero placental insufficiency in the presence of severe acidemia results in decelerations that are mediated by the heart itself, not any external autonomic mechanism. So we have two pathways that can produce decelerations from simulated utero placental dysfunction. On the left, with normal acid-base status, deceleration is entirely mediated by the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. And on the right, with very, very marked acidemia, it is solely mediated by the myocardium. Now, these pathways aren't mutually exclusive. They may operate at the same time, especially when conditions are somewhere in between normal gases on the left and extremely abnormal on the right. Now, while it is useful to look and understand these experiments, they are somewhat artificial in that any human fetus is unlikely to experience complete cessation of uterine blood flow to this degree with each contraction. So let's look at some um, human studies. This is a study of a large group of patients, uh, over 5,000 low-risk deliveries. And the first question is, what is the incidence of sporadic late deceleration? Well, they occurred in about 5.5% of patients. And in most of those patients, variability was normal. And very few, only 1%, went on to have a pH of less than 7.1. Well, what about recurrent late decelerations? They occurred in about 1.8%. Most had normal variability. And those with normal variability, about 10% went on to have a low pH. With minimal or absent variability, 20% went on to have low pH. But the worst combination in this study was those patients who presented with low variability and recurrent late decelerations on admission. Uncommon in 0.43%. But 42% of these babies went on to deliver uh, with a pH less than 7. And 33% of them went on to develop uh, either cerebral palsy or died. So what can we conclude about decelerations from utero placental dysfunction? They're an uncommon pattern. There are multiple physiological pathways and therefore multiple shapes that they can take. Not all late decelerations indicate myocardial hypoxia or acidemia. And the presence of low variability with recurrent lates on admission is a very concerning pattern. All right, we're getting close to the point of asking you our first question. Uh, I'll begin with a case presentation and show you a tracing. And my question to you is, would you deliver at 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0.3? So to begin with, this is a 25-year-old nulliparous patient with an uncomplicated pregnancy. She's admitted in spontaneous labor at term. She delivers spontaneously 12 hours later a uh, 3.1 kilogram baby. She received no oxytocin, she had no meconium, and her labor progression was normal. Now let's look at her tracing. This is her tracing on admission at 3.30 in the morning. By 5 o'clock in the morning, her contractions are quite active, and this is what her tracing looks like. By 7 o'clock in the morning, she's 3 centimeters, and her tracing begins to change a little. At 8 o'clock in the morning, it looks like this. At 9 o'clock in the morning, it looks like this. And on the lower panel at 10.20, she's examined and found to be 5 centimeters. At 10.45, where the number 1 is, her tracing is shown in the lower panel. And my question is, would you recommend delivery at point number 1? She didn't deliver at that point, so we have tracing after that. At 12 o'clock, you can see her tracing in the upper panel. By 1 o'clock in the afternoon, her tracing in the lower panel, she's now 6 centimeters. And at 2 o'clock, her tracing has the appearance in the upper panel. And by 2.25, where the number 2 is, is the second point, which I'd like you to determine whether or not you would recommend delivery. Well, delivery was not uh, recommended or instituted. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, she is 10 centimeters. 
and she actually delivers at 350 on the right where that uh, blue arrow is. So um, we are going to put up a polling mechanism for you to answer and the question is for this particular patient would you have recommended delivery intervention at point one, 1045 in the morning at point two, 245 or not at all at point three when she actually did deliver. So, Okay, so we have some results here and we have as expected a range of results but the most common answer was two. Well, I showed this file uh, to experts and most of them also would have delivered at uh, point two. And in fact, this baby delivered and was very healthy. Spontaneous delivery, APGAR is eight of nine, pH 7.25, and a base deficit of four. Now, I concur that delivery at point two was very reasonable. And I chose this tracing to demonstrate that even with a concerning tracing of this nature, babies can be fine. Intervention is very reasonable because at that point at 2 o'clock, she had at least 20% chance of significant acidemia. And this kind of tracing appears relatively rarely, approximately three times per 1,000. All right, we have one more question now. This is a Nola Paris patient at term. She's 41 weeks. She's admitted in spontaneous labor, which lasts four hours. She delivers a 3.7 kilogram baby. Outcome is very different. pH is 6.9. Base deficit is 20.7. APGARs are 3 and 6. And here is her tracing. Now, this is the appearance of her tracing on admission. And you can see um, pericon patterns is marked uh, recurrent late uh, decelerations. You can see the entire four hours in the compressed view underneath uh, the tracing, and you can see that that pattern of decelerations has continued across those four hours. And this is what her tracing looks like um, just a few minutes before delivery. Baseline has now risen to 180. So our question to you is, this tracing is highly concerning because of the following. Choose the most appropriate. One, abnormal EFM patterns on admission. Two, decelerations with almost every contraction, three, high and rising baseline with low baseline variability, four, abnormalities that persist for more than four hours, and five, all of the above. All right, oh, so we have a high degree of concurrence here uh, that uh, all of the features are abnormal, and that's absolutely correct. Fetal monitoring is an imprecise science, but when we have numerous worrying conditions, uh, then our decisions are certainly much easier. All right, let's move along and talk about decelerations from umbilical cord compression. We'll begin with some work by uh, Dr. Westgate, uh, again working with sheep and implanting those devices and compressing the umbilical cord now. During the um, compression of the cord, hypertension develops in the fetus and that's accompanied by a deceleration. And similar experience with blocking ages led to the well-established mechanism which is outlined on the right. Cord compression, hypertension, baroreceptor response, parasympathetic stimulation, and slowing of the fetal heart rate. Now she conducted some other experiments which were very interesting. In this first set of experiments, she completely occluded the cord for one minute every five minutes. And these were healthy fetal sheep and this experiment went on for four hours. And you can see the pattern in the first, mid, and last 30 minutes. During this experiment, the hypertension developed during each occlusion, the fetal heart rate fell, and over the course of the four hours, the pH and base deficit remained stable, and the size and the shape of the decelerations remained stable. Now, a completely different picture arose when she did exactly the same occlusion, one minute occlusion, but now every two and a half minutes. The feed sheep all developed severe acidosis and some much before four hours. And as you can see in the experiment, the hypertension gave way to hypotension during the occlusion and the fetal heart rate decelerations became steeper and deeper. All of these fetal sheep had in central nervous system injuries. Now she went on uh, 
again, to experiment with the effect of vagotomy. Uh, this is a fetal sheep experiment in which the cord is clamped for eight minutes, and you can see the uh, serious deceleration outlined in red. And when she conducted the same experiment, but this time with having cut the vagus nerve, you can see in black what happened. The deceleration was slower, perhaps a little bit deeper, lasted the same duration, and then recovered equally abruptly. In other words, cord compression, even in the presence of complete vagal absence, will result in a fetal heart rate deceleration, and this is thought to result from myocardium uh, effects. So for the mechanisms of uh, cord compression, we have on, on the left, hypertension, barosector, vagus influences, and on the right, with severe compression or severe acidosis, myocardial depression. But we also have a state in between where there is developing acidosis, low pH, chemoreceptor response, and the mechanisms um, as described before. All right, let's move to uh, baseline variability for a moment and we'll begin with some basic facts. The variability of the heart rate comes from three sources. It comes from the heart itself. Even if we completely denervate the heart, it will have variability. Uh, if you completely denervate the heart, about 20% of variability disappears. If we um, the other source of variability, of course, is the central nervous system, this constant push-pull effect of the sympathetic and the parasympathetic system, and other CNS states such as drugs or malformation or sleep or uh, chronic injury. And finally, there are circulating catecholamines which affect both the central nervous system and the heart itself. Now, I expect everybody is familiar with the statement moderate fetal heart rate variability reliably predicts the absence of fetal acidemia at the time that it is observed. Several NIH documents, and here I've quoted the one from 2008, where the Canterbury 1, 2, and 3 was defined. But I have a question. I have not yet found a good answer. How reliable? Is it 100% reliable? And how much acidemia is this statement referring to? So I'd like to look at a couple of um, animal studies and then some human studies. This first page is uh, some animal studies. We have uh, monkeys and sheep. Uh, hypoxemia was induced in a variety of ways. As we move down the page, uh, things are getting more serious. But you can see that almost all of these animal experiments showed increased variability. Only with uh, Muratowski and Bakken did they see decreased variability when the hypoxemia persisted for 21 days, and Kazuma et al., when the degree of acidosis had reached 6.92. Let's look at some human studies. Again, I've listed these with increasing um, amounts of acidosis as we move down the page. Well, the first one from 1994, where the outcome was a baby with a pH less than 7.2, in other words, mild acidosis, 74% had normal variability. So normal variability did not pr predict the absence of low pH. Dr. Cahill looked at low variability and pH of less than 7.1. Only 9% had low variability. 91% had normal. As, as we move down the page, you can see that low variability does increase. My conclusion from this is that low variability or the development of low variability is a late phenomenon. It comes with rather severe acidemia. Now, I have one uh, last case to show you. No question involved in this one. I'll tell you the answer. And uh, this baby delivers after 12 hours with a pH of 6.89, base deficit of 21, near lethal level. This is the tracing on admission. Looks quite normal. Two and a half hours before delivery, we can see that she's developing variable decelerations. An hour before delivery, those decelerations are more frequent, and they are deeper and wider. The last 30 minutes before delivery, you can see that, in fact, here, um, sort of halfway across the page, you can see that there's been a sudden change in her variability from normal to progressively less than normal. This baby 
delivered with a pH 6.89 and a base deficit of 21. So this baby lost variability quite abruptly, and there was only 11 minutes before birth. It's quite compatible with the um, reports of others that loss of variability occurs with advanced acidemia. So our conclusions about uh, variability, um, initial response to hypoxemia in experimental conditions is an increase in variability. Low variability appears with advanced acidemia, and it can be there with other depressing or chronic central nervous system conditions. Well, let's wrap up and try and summarize uh, all of this material. It's clear that EFM patterns are the result of many overlapping physiological pathways, and that those pathways change in the presence of severe academia, irrespective of whether the initial cause was utero placental or cord compression problems. Important considerations for EFM interpretation, decelerations from utero placental insufficiency and cord compression share common physiological pathways, especially as academia develops and therefore their appearance can become more similar. Size and frequency of decelerations are important. The duration of the EFM problem and its progression are important. Loss of baseline variability is a late change. And it's important always to consider the underlying state of our baby. What is its tolerance? Is that baby growth retarded or not? And what is the cause of the deceleration and therefore its potential for progression, such as severe abruption or uterine rupture? So ladies and gentlemen, this uh, concludes the formal part of our presentation uh, today. Uh, thank you very much uh, for attending, and thank you very much uh, for your participation.